Greetings, everyone. Thanks for joining us again here for Lessons from Leaders. We're so lucky we have Shamal Idris here, who's the CEO for Search for Common Ground. And he, just a teeny bit about his own background is that he was telling me he grew up, and this is a quote, across dividing lines. And because of his background, that led him to dedicate his work and his life to peace building which is the work that Search for Common Ground does, being the largest peace building organization in the world. And three things about Search for Common Ground that impressed me was one, that the um, foreign minister for Iran and the former sec uh, Secretary of State Kerry both acknowledged the work that Search for Common Ground did in getting the Iran, the Iran nuclear agreement. Um, the Quakers nominated Search for Common Ground for a Nobel Peace Prize last year, which is fabulous. And then a very high ranking diplomat, American diplomat in the African Affairs Division also has acknowledged Search for Common Ground's work in preventing genocide in Burundi. So what I love about these stories is it tells us the impact that the organization, organization is making in the world. And, we're so happy that you are here with us today to talk to us about your how you see leadership, the challenges and the joys and um, some of the struggles you see in the nonprofit sector. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here, Lynn. Good. I thought for starting out, maybe uh, the little, we give a little tantalizing bit about your growing up across dividing lines, if you want to just say a little bit about that, so we're not on tenterhooks wondering what that means. Well, I don't mean to make it sound too dramatic. My, you know, my, my mother was born in Turkey and my father in Syria, uh, and I was born here in the United States. And we would go back to what was then sort of rural uh, Turkey. It's now where my mother's entire extended family lived in one large compound. Uh, with everyone in each other's business, um, a, a pretty poor part of the country. It's now a small city. Um, uh, so we would do that every summer. Um, and, and yet we were growing up in New Canaan, Connecticut. My parents did everything they could, like a lot of immigrant parents try to do, uh, to get my brother and I to the best education system possible. So New Canaan, Connecticut is a very privileged, uh, um, a wealthy part of this country. We were the only Muslim family that I knew growing up in, in New Canaan. Uh, but we had access to wonderful public education. Um, every summer, uh, once I started taking summer jobs uh, and, and not going back to Turkey every summer, I got into my teen years and I was taking these jobs, I started working for uh, the public interest research groups, the PERGs, uh, Ralph Nader's organization, doing door-to-door -door canvassing for environmental and consumer protection causes, uh, getting a lot of doors slammed in my face, learning um, how you raise money and how you get signatures, this kind of thing. Uh, and the culture of the PERGs was very sort of young uh, activists, very anti-corporate, corporations were the enemy, sort of. Um, and yet growing up in New Canaan, the parents of some of my closest friends were CEOs or high-level executives of some of the biggest corporations in the world. Uh, and then I went from, from New Canaan, where the politics was fairly conservative, to uh, Swarthmore College, which was both much more diverse and much more politically liberal than what I had grown up with. So anyway, all of the, whether it was going back and forth to Turkey and New Canaan, Connecticut, or it was you know, going back and forth between a very liberal, very conservative, uh, entirely non-Muslim, majority Muslim populations, all of these things, um, it made it very difficult for me, you know, as I developed really close relationships and, and respect for people across all those supposed dividing lines, it made it very difficult for me to buy, you know, when, when folks thought, you know, all the good was over on this side and all the bad was on that side. Um, and that's just how I grew up. That's interesting. So not only like cross-culturally being the first generation American, um, but also different socioeconomic. There's so many layers to that. Yeah, that I think a lot, a lot of people these days, increasingly people are having this experience of uh, growing up with uh, multiplicity of identities and, and uh, insights into lots of different cultures. And do you, in your, so in your job, do you bring that with you consciously or is it so part of you you don't you don't know that it's there like i think it's very much imbued i mean it, to be honest with you you know in talking about this as what motivated me motivated me to get into peace building it's really only in retrospect that i sort of connected those dots you know at the time i, I just realized wow i really there's something about swarthmore college's culture that made me want to go there it was only upon reflection later that i realized you know as a quaker school um, 
you know, you get exposed to conflict resolution and I got trained as a mediator and just the, that culture is, uh, you know, embedded within it are a lot of the values and insights that I just sort of grew up with, um, uh, seeing a lot, you know, starting from a point of respect for diversity, uh, um, seeking to understand uh, that even or especially those that you most disagree with, all of that. And so it wasn't sort of a rational process for me. I think, you know, in, in looking back on how did I get into this field, I realized that I, I think to some extent it was sort of baked in from the experiences right. that I was having as a young, from a young child all the way through to adulthood. That makes sense to me. I, because I know that we just put one foot in front of the other and we don't think I'm heading for this place. You know, this is interesting and that's interesting and I'm liking this and only in retrospect do we see how we got there. I mean, there are those people who say, I knew from the age of whatever what I would be. I mean, you know, I just turned um, uh, 47 uh, last week and uh, I don't know what, what I want to be when I grew up. So <laughs> I've never been one of those people who I admire, to some extent, I admire people who are that directed. I've always had been very, very fortunate um, to follow what seemed most exciting or interesting to me. And that's led me you know, down this path. And I wanted to jump in. You and I were talking the other day about your thoughts about some of the challenges of the nonprofit sector. Um, and I wanted to go there right away because for you that was at the moment that seemed to be something that you had on your mind that, that you wanted to make sure that we covered. Um, you, you were talking about the dynamics that impact the nonprofit sector. Do you remember what they were? Yeah, I mean, there was there's one in particular that uh, that I think affects um, the internal management uh, of nonprofits, and there's another that really speaks to um, the external um, activism and the social change agenda and how it's pursued. So on the first one, you know, um, uh, and not wanting to be misunderstood, I think there are many excellent managers and leaders across the nonprofit sector. I think the sector is chronically uh, hamstrung in terms of uh, attracting and retaining quality management um, uh, uh, and, and challenge sometimes um, for a couple of reasons. One, which has you know, gotten more attention in the last several years from certain donors in particular, is the impact that the donor culture has on nonprofits. So uh, what I would call the sort of arbitrary and wrong-headed focus on um, low overhead rates as somehow a marker of quality nonprofits um, uh, is, is a way to ensure that you're always under resourcing management systems, uh, the, the, the organization foundation, the, the, the level of and the experience of managers that you can recruit and attract. Um, and again, it's not to say that you can't get brilliant managers who are willing to work for free or close to free, but, um, but that pressure um, you know, which doesn't really exist at all in the for-profit sector, um, I think chronically uh, undercuts the kind of management that you can, you know, recruit and retain. Um, if you, if I buy a, a product uh, from a company, um, I really couldn't care less how much they spent on this versus that in yeah. producing that product. I just, is it a good product or not? Is it worth the cost or not? And I think in the nonprofit sector, um, you know, you want to use the term bang for the buck, um, you know, is the social change that this organization is able to deliver worth the investment that is being sought? Um, that really, in my view, should be the bottom line. Um, and the notion that, well, it'll be much better if, uh, if we're only covering 3% of their overhead cost versus whatever, um, really is a, is a chronic problem uh, in, the, in the field. So that's one thing. I think a second thing that affects internal management, which I've sort of learned through failure, probably more than anything, uh, and I've been reflecting on this a lot in my current position is the, um, is the, uh, you know, you'll see a lot of nonprofits and we've had this too, where, um, people will be frustrated internally and say, you know, we're not living by our values. We're not, we're not walking the talk. And you'll see, that's a very consistent critique of a lot of nonprofit organizations that you see. And, and, uh, I think absolutely that's sometimes the case, you know, um, maybe a peace building organization like ours, maybe we don't always do the best job of dealing with conflict internally or a climate change organization, maybe it doesn't always have all the policies you would expect them to have, you know, relative to protecting the environment. But, um, but I think oftentimes what happens is that notion of um, this organization isn't walking the talk is sort of a proxy for something that happens so often in the nonprofit sector, which is that we never really make the effort to explicitly articulate the values 
that we want to define our work culture, our, own, our organizations internally. And I think that happens a lot because um, people will presume that the external mission of the organization should provide all of the principles and values uh, that are relevant for working there. Um, and it's true, there are certain values that are absolutely embedded in, um, in the mission. As a peace building organization, clearly the dignity of every perspective, the dignity of every, every individual, and therefore inclusion is a really important principle and value for our organization. Um, you know, um, uh, it's similarly collaboration. There's a high premium on collaboration because we believe in all of our work that dialogue is is necessary but insufficient as a way to really build community. You have to get people collaborating across the dividing line. So you can, you know, you can posit certain values from any nonprofit's mission, um, but that doesn't say anything, or that's a, that doesn't say everything about how you intend and want to work internally. Um, you could say, for instance, that um, uh, you know we work in such a challenging environment, uh, and that opportunities come up, you know, oftentimes without able to plan for them. So when opportunities come up, we're going to be incredibly opportunistic. We're going to drop everything else and we're going to do whatever it takes to get the jobs done. You know, that maybe that's your end. So weekends, holidays, be damned, whatever it might be, mm -hmm. that's what's expected. Or you could say, you know what, um, we put a real premium on inclusion. So we're going to understand that sometimes we might move slower uh, or we might require much more consultative processes that might, you know, take more time to generate um, decisions. Um, but that's really important to us. Or you could say, you know what, we're, we're inherently risky. We want to take big risks and we're trying to do big things. Therefore, we're going to tolerate really high fail rates. We're going to understand that, you know, we're going to fail fairly often. That's okay with us. Um, but whatever it, it is, uh, I think it's, I've learned through mainly mistakes on this front, that it's really important to take the time to articulate those values and not a laundry list of them um but a real lim limited number of them um beyond and in addition to what your mission says your values are um and then be very explicit with them uh about them not just so that people know what they're walking into when, when they when they when they come in um hire and promote but also fire according to those values develop rituals um that reinforce them be obsessive about them to the point where it's sort of ad nauseum everybody who comes in to an organization and um i've been thinking about this a lot lately because we're just going through this process now at search for common ground or really trying to um uh take a, a fresh look at what our values are beyond and in addition to the values that are imbued in our you know conflict transformation and peace building mission um, what kind of place do we want to be? What kind of workplace do we want to be? Um, and I think oftentimes when you don't do that, people come in with wildly different work styles, expectations of the work-life balance they want to have or will have, um, expectations of what it means to work on, on, an, on an effective organization, um, all of these kinds of things that rarely are answered by the external mission statement of the organization, you know, um, and so that's something that I think, I think uh, plagues a lot of nonprofit organizations, or at least I've, in organizations I've run, I've, I've seen that and I'm you know, trying to learn from that. Um, so that's the second one. I think in terms of, so that's all on the internal, you know, whether it's the, the low overhead rates and what that does to securing and retaining good management, or it's the inattention to the internal values and the work culture that we want to create and being explicit about it. Um, and incidentally on that one, one thing I've also looked at is the degree to which organizations and companies that do that well, they they do hire and fire according to that. So they don't just fire or withhold promotions for poor performance. This is sort of separate from performance. You could have an excellent performer, but who's doing it in a way that's contrary to the organization's values, and that person's got to go, or they've got to change, you know. Um, so those are all on the internal. On the external, I think- So before you go on, let's yeah. just hold up there. So don't forget the external. So the, the, in, the, the first one is, is, of course, very interesting, and the, everyone who's worked in a nonprofit knows that's a false measurement, how low the overhead is, if that's a measure of a good or, um, you know, a, an effective nonprofit or not. And I love your metaphor of, um, you know, when, if you're going to buy a car, you don't care how, that wasn't the, the example you gave, but if you don't care sure. how what their overhead is, what is do they this, pay on advertisement? What do they pay on the paint job versus the, you know, exactly, who cares? Is this the product that I want? And I love that I hadn't in my own mind reached that 
endpoint. Is this the product that's effective? If it is, what do we care what the overhead is? Because we're achieving the goal that we said we want to achieve. We being the collective humanity. We want these people to learn to read or the children to, you know, not die when they're five or whatever. Is this the product that we want? What do we care what the overhead is? Um, so that's, that was, uh, I liked that a lot. The second bit is so it's, I also hadn't thought about um, the values um, that why people come in believing that, you know, these values that we're upholding for our work should also be part of our values here. What I see, and, and I've had discussions with organizations about whether they you do have a separate set of values that are just on how we work together or how this we are, what our organization is, what the culture is. What I see a lot of struggle with, and this is where I wanted to pause you right here because you spoke about your own failures, which I love hearing failure stories, um, is what I see is people, even if organizations set their internal values or culture, leaders have a hard time holding that. This is what we're doing. This is the behavior I'm expecting of you. And there's no, you know, you may be the best sanitation engineer in the world, but your, your behavior is not fitting our values. That seems to be very difficult for a lot of um, nonprofits. That's, and leaders don't keep their, in my experience, many people have a hard time keeping their eye on that ball. So. Well, I yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, when I looked at this, uh, there's there are two sides to what I'm hearing you say, uh, or uh, I'm I'm projecting at least one, and you definitely said the other. So, yes. so one side is that I think um, articulating those values, but then leaders not reflecting them in their own behavior, uh, that that's a real problem, right? So that that will very quickly get people in the organization. I think if you become obsessive about those values and you're hiring, promoting, firing according to them and you have rituals uh, that celebrate them and incentivize them and all these things and yet when difficult decisions are being made in particular the decisions are don't seem to at all draw upon that set of values I mean then you've got a real problem um, and and so that's one side I think that's one side of it I think if you know as we're going through this process now at search maybe you and I can talk in another year or you know like it, it um, uh, or perhaps more accurately, you should talk to others in the organization on how we're doing. You know, I think that people in the organization should feel like we're all accountable to one another for living by those values. And that includes anyone in the organization being able to say, hold on a second, CEO or president or VP of whatever, like you, we, we have this set of values. We just came up against a really critical, difficult decision. And, um, the rationale for the decision you made seems complete, completely, you know, contrary to what you said. And so I think that's one side of it. I think the other side of it is about largely about good or bad management, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, being able to, you're like following through on that kind of, and, and remaining uh, disciplined and consistent um, and reliable in, in the feedback that you're giving people and the way that you're managing folks. And, and um, I'm not going to be pretend to be really good at this. You know, just less than a year ago, we recruited. I split my job into two. I used to be the CEO and president, and uh, we recruited a president. I split my job into two for, for two reasons. Uh, one was really around this, not just specifically the values piece, but the broader issue of recognizing managing a, a relatively large organization, or at least large for me. I mean, in the universe of executives you've interviewed, Search for Common Ground is not huge. Most of the, all of the major development and humanitarian agencies dwarf us in size and budget and staffing. But we've got more than 700 staff now, you know, and we operate in, in more than 25 countries. And so it's a complex operation. Um, I've never managed anything nearly that size. And so first thing that I was looking for in a president is someone with really the experience um, of managing a large, complex international organization. Um, uh, but the um, uh, the second and the second reason was, you know, the peace building sector. This goes to some of the externally facing stuff we'll talk about. We really need to elevate the visibility and credibility of the sector. And, and what I happen to do better um, uh, than my management skill set is um, uh, is external representation. So about 95 percent of my job now is, is externally facing. But on this point that you're raising, you know, I think that it cuts both ways. Both our, our managers walking the talk themselves. We articulated these values. Are you actually making decisions according to them? And ideally developing an organizational culture when anybody anybody can can hold anyone accountable 
to to that. Um, and second, just being having strong management, where you know, uh, wherever you come into the organization, you feel like you have a reliable and consistent experience for more or less. Um, and that's really tough. And we, we're no, we're not there right now as our organization. Um, uh, just because we're very disparate, we've grown in a very decentralized way. And I think if you came into our organization in three different spots, you'd probably have, you could have three very different experiences. Um, some things would be consistent. So, um, so it's a challenge. So thank you. So what are the, some of the things that you have, you know, that brought you here? What are some of the insights that you had or the learnings that you had that you you realized what was happening with people with thinking of values and that you needed to focus on culture and how did you get there? Uh, well, you know, things like, you know, we, we would be, you know, uh, have an incredible breakthrough or achieve wonderful things, a big fundraising breakthrough, a new programming area, um, and yet still come across um, staff, including, you know, really committed staff, who were dissatisfied or felt like the organization and, and this very specific critique of, hey, we're not walking the talk. And then someone forwarded to me, I had a conversation with uh, somebody who is uh, in charge of diversity and inclusion in one of the largest foundations in the world. Uh, and she was really dealing with this within the foundation world. And she, she shared with me this article um, about, uh, about this very subject. And it happened to take a case study. And it happened to take a case study of a peace building organization and one that I knew very well. It didn't happen to be ours, but I knew very well. Right. And as I read the article, the diagnosis that the article was coming up with um, seemed to me to be actually completely off. And as I read it, I realized, you know what, I think I know that case. And I think, and that really got me thinking, you know, I, I think this is much more uh, a, a, an issue of, I know, for instance, that that organization, when the founder moved on, as oftentimes happens, many nonprofits collapse within five years of the founder moving on. Um, and in the case of this organization, they recruited um, multiple different chief executives until they finally landed on somebody um, who's very competent but came up from within the organization. But if you look at the succession of people they recruited, I don't think you could come across a more disparate uh, kind of work styles and work cultures that they had grown up. And that said to, that said to me, oh, wow, you like, you, you know, being really explicit about what is that work culture that you want to be reinforcing and championing and, 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 you know, celebrating and perpetuating, that's something really important. And I, and I, I'm looking at our own case, I felt like, you know, what, we haven't done that sufficiently at Search for Common Ground. Um, as I said, we're going through this, we're going through this process now. Um, and, and, I think I think turning that kind of process into something well beyond you know a value statement that sits on people's walls right. um, is really where I started looking into how some nonprofits and corporations um, do become quite obsessive, quite obsessive about their values, and it's not just in the job descriptions, but it makes up uh, every performance review. Uh, harkens back to the values. There are rituals of celebration that are specifically tied to the values. There are multiple ways uh, every week where employees will somehow or another come up <laughs> into interaction with an explicit articulation of those values. When decisions are made, their genuine justification and then also how they're explained is according to those values. Like, so the, the, just a multiple. So, and, and I realized that, you know what, I think I've been, op I've been very mission driven in my life and I think I just, just I kind of never thought about you know to me all the values that are imbued in peace building as a as a mission to devote your life to that seemed to me to be everything that you needed but actually I don't think it is and I, I don't think it is for most nonprofits I think I think um, you know you could be a peace building organization um, that runs you know in, in very different in, in incredibly different ways that has very different very different work cultures and I I do want to say I don't I don't. I'm not saying that the external, the values related to the external mission are irrelevant. Absolutely not. And there will be, there should be, um, at the very least, least, real synergy, if not explicit overlap, you know, between some of those values. But, but all I'm saying is that the external mission statement and the values that are connected to it, um, oftentimes, are not explicit enough about what the work culture is and, and that we want it to be, and we're going to ensure that it, you know, that it is. That's, that's excellent. And then just to say what you, to repeat what you said earlier, then people make assumptions about what the values are. Mm 
and then they get on and there's unhappiness because there's not those assumptions aren't being met. Right. Oh, and, gee, I'm being asked to work over the weekend. I'm working for a human rights organization. That's a violation of dignity right. for me or something. We're, you know, <laughs> um, and I don't mean, I'm not laughing that off. Is that that's irrelevant. It's in some places, you know, be very explicit that that's the kind of place that you're going to be. And so there, this is a great workforce for certain kinds of people. Like I would rather come across an organization that was really explicit that this is, these are the values here. Uh, you know what you're signing up for when you come in. And when you come in, you can be assured that this can be pretty, you know, it can be reliable that that's the way this place is going to function according to those values. Um, and, 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 and you know that. Um, rather than having to presume that or seeing people come in with wildly divergent expectations or management practices and realize, I actually don't know what the values are here. And then the, the way that oftentimes the complaint comes out is, vis-a-vis -vis the only values that have been articulated, which is related to the external mission. That doesn't mean that's irrelevant, but oftentimes that's, that's not the full story of what's going on, I think. I think that's very, very important. And you've given me a different way to think about it, added to my own thinking. Um, so I, I appreciate that. I hadn't linked it all to people linking the in external values to the way to the way they should be treated internally and it's not always they don't always go together or not that they don't go together but there's other things another bowl that the culture needs to sit in um and it will be we will want to i will want to follow up with you because i want to hear what you learn through this process because deciding what the values are and picking them and putting everything in place and then making it part of the air that you breathe there's there's the rub or yeah. there's another layer to another mountain to climb yeah i mean i do think in that kind of process it's a combination of um it's a combination of articulating what you want them to be and enabling them to surface because the organization already every organization already has a culture Right. I mean, it, like there are already certain values that are being played out. So I, it, I don't think it's just a, a grafting on of some kind of foreign set of values. It's this combination of, hey, as you know, what do we want the values of this organization to be and sussing out from the global team? And what are they already? What draws people? What, what draws our best people and keeps them here? Yes, that's beautiful. You know, um, and we'll see. I, again, I'll be happy to talk to you. But I'll try to be very transparent and honest about how it's going because it's a challenge. And it would be, it's a learn, this is a place that I think a lot of NGOs are struggling with, right, are arriving at this place where you're arriving at, you know, and so it'll be a good um, learning for others, so your own lessons learned. So let's, um, let's continue on to the external, because this is also very interesting, we talked about it the other day, um, and uh, was new, it was, uh, changed my thinking so i believe you're going to talk about the peace building are you going to talk about peace building? um well there are two uh, here too there too so okay. there's one that i think in my humble opinion is is i don't want to overstate that that's chronic but it's very prevalent i think in the nonprofit sector generally and there's another that's really specific to what makes for effective peace building so in on the first one um and, and it, this one ties to, frankly, kind of part of why, what draws me to the peace building field. Uh, I, I think there are, there are probably a hundred ways to make social change, but there are two in particular <laughs> that, um, that I think are relevant here. There's an adversarial approach um, to driving change. Um, and there's a collaborative approach. And, uh, and, and I think we are, we in the United States, we, across cultures globally, uh, we in the social change world, whether it's on human rights or environmental issues or whatever it might be, we're way over invested in adversarial approaches to drive change. Um, and the more interconnected the world becomes, the more that the big issues we have to solve are gonna require unprecedented levels of cooperation. For instance, climate change, um, you gotta have all, you, all countries have to be on board. You have to have the public and private sector working together. It's just a level of cooperation to tackle climate change, Sp preventing the spread of nuclear weapons, you know, nuclear nonproliferation. You know, if, if, uh, if one party isn't playing by that role, that's enough to, you know, um, or the, the preventing the spread of pandemic disease. Like you, so, and, and you can go down any of the major issues today, the world is so interconnected that whether we like it or not, um, 
it, most of the major issues require us to generate an unprecedented level of collaboration and cooperation across cultures, across nations, across the public private sector, across generations, et cetera. Um, and so the adversarial approach, which I would sort of describe in, in three steps, um, identify an issue you really care about. And I think any of your viewers could, you know, just do this in, in the, on their own, you know, identify an issue you care about, um, identify who agrees with you and who opposes you. And third, organize yourselves with the former to go to war with the latter, literally or figuratively. And, and, and the way that that approach tends, I mean, that's how our political campaigns play out. That's how um, uh, our judicial system is inherently an adversarial system. Um, that's the way a lot of social change campaigns are organized. Um, and I think what that, I don't want to say that that ap approach is never relevant. I really don't want to say that. But in, uh, in an interdependent world, I think that approach too often yields temporary victories. Uh, victories where one side wins, but the other side is just biding their time and reorganizing themselves to overcome. Um, and it erodes relations, you know, it erodes trust and respect across uh, communities over time and leads to increased polarization. And I think that we are, in my view, I think we're seeing that in many, many countries today. I think we're definitely see that, seeing that in our politics in the U.S. And I think in the U.K., my mother's family in Turkey, I think, you know, we have family members who have, um, let's just say, very divergent views about the political situation in mm. Turkey, so much so that they've agreed just not even to talk about it. Mm. <laughs> um, and, and on and on and on. Uh, the collaborative approach to social change, uh, I could also describe in three steps. It starts from the same step. You choose an issue you really care about. Um, but the second step is to identify all the stakeholders. Stakeholder is a sort of an old fashioned word, but identify everyone whose lives are going to be affected by how that issue plays out. And then the third step is to do whatever you can to build trust, respect and collaboration across those stakeholder groups to tackle the issue together, to frame it in a way that everyone feels welcome, you know, to, to address it and to, um, and to, and, and this sounds theoretical, but I think it's, 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 this is quite, uh, but frankly, this goes to the core of what Search for Common Ground uh, does uh, uh, around around the world. Um, and I can kind of tell a quick story about the founding of our organization. You know, our, we 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 grew out of the U.S. engagement in Vietnam. M my predecessor, the founder of the organization, John Marks, was a Foreign Service officer, an American Foreign Service officer, um, and he quit the Foreign Service in protest to the war. And then he joined the staff of the Republican senator who drafted the legislation that cut the funding to the war, which as you probably know, is what ended the American involvement in Vietnam, is that you know, Congress stopped paying for it. And then he went on to a highly successful career as an investigative journalist, and he wrote two best-selling exposés of the CIA, which got him in a lot of hot water. And so he was becoming, I don't know if you say a cult figure, but he was becoming somewhat of a known figure in the whole kind of anti-war, anti-establishment movement of the late 60s and 70s. And towards the late 70s, John had a you know, what he, to this day he describes as a real epiphany, a life-changing realization, really on two fronts. One was, that, as he describes it still to this day, that his entire life was at, oriented around adversarial advocacy. He was spending all of his time trying to tear down the old system rather than build a new system. I think a lot of people feel that kind of exhaustion and negativity in their lives right now. And second, that as clear and black and white as all the issues seem to be that he was concerned with, once he actually met people who disagreed with them, oftentimes, um, not always, but oftentimes, he found that they were people of real integrity, of genuine values, of, of, of respectable, you know, uh, it, you know, and understandable uh, interests. Um, and, and that just made it a lot harder. So, you know, John came through a life of real out there activism and trying to change the world. He came to the realization that, that I think I came to at a much younger age without working nearly as hard at it, because it's just kind of how I grew up, um, uh, of, of seeing values in different. And, and I, I want to say something, because whenever you talk about this, immediately the question of power comes up. Well, there are power differentials, and sometimes you do have just bad actors, right? And you've got people who profit off of all kinds of injustices. And, and, and that's absolutely true. And my experience is that uh, we way overestimate uh, the the number and kind of people who are quote unquote beyond the pale in that way. Um, you know, in the experience that we have at Search for Common Ground now, working on, in, with a lot of governments, for instance, that um, 
let's just say not, not all of them are protecting the human rights of their citizens and are, you know, um, what we found is there are rapacious leaders. I mean, there are people who are pillaging and kind of, there are also a lot of leaders who are really struggling, really struggling with how limited the tools of government are today in dealing with the way conflict happens today. Um, you know, behind closed doors, you know, we find a lot of government leaders who frankly are scared of their own youth populations, um, uh, who don't know how to deal with uh, transnational movements, you know, white supremacist groups or uh, 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 violent extremist groups, et cetera. So I'm going into all of that because um, I don't say this, I don't put out this dichotomy of adversarial versus collaborative approaches um, in a way so as to ignore that there are there is good and bad in the world. And there are, but I think that um, if you look at uh, efforts to drive social change, it so often um, uh, paints uh, a whole lot of people as being beyond the pale um, or, or not worthy of the dignity and respect that, that I would say they are. Um, and in a way, it's a lot easier to mobilize people that way by painting an enemy that we're going to go after and, and, and combat. Um, there is, I don't know, you know, any of your viewers will remember Jesse Helms, the, the very conservative North Carolina senator. Um, they might know also Bono, the, the, the U2 rock star. So people might not know this story, but this is a, for me, this is a very good story of very prominent people who are involved in this kind of process, right? This kind of collaborative approach. Um, uh, and you can read about this. I think this was written up in The Guardian and a couple other places. I actually had the opportunity to talk to Bono about this and, and confirm that from his point of view, this is what happened. And I didn't get to talk to Helms before he passed. But Jesse Helms was um, one of the longest standing and most conservative uh, members of the US Senate from North Carolina. Uh, very powerful, I think he chaired the Foreign Relations Committee um, uh, for many years. Uh, and and um, at a certain point um, in trying to address the issue of African debt relief and increasing humanitarian assistance to Africa, um, Bono came to realize that Helms would be a really critical person. So he reached out and started to get to know Helms. Um, and these images of, of Bono in his sunglasses meeting Helms in his Senate office. And, um, and, they, and he found that uh, uh, they, they, they bonded over uh, Christian values and principles. And Bono grew up in a very religious family. And, and Helms, for Helms, you know, Christianity was really quite important to him. And was, uh, you know, it was deeply uh, meaningful for him. It was an important part of who he was and, it was, and his identity is, and his self-identity. Um, and they bonded over this, and, and they met many times. At one point, Helms even went backstage to one of Bono's concerts. Mm. I would have paid to see that as well. Um, but the story goes that, that uh, and, and Bono was facing all kinds of heat from his lead guitarist and other people. Why are you humanizing this guy? Why are you reaching out across these dividing lines? You know? uh, but at a certain point, you know, they had a real um, deep connection. And, and uh, the story goes that Helms actually broke down crying at one point, recognizing the, the devastating impact on Africa and millions of African lives that the debt burden was having and, 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 and that many other, you know, development legacies of colonialism said we're having. Um, and he became one of the biggest champions, both for African debt relief and, and for major humanitarian assistance to, to Africa. Um, and I think if Bono had taken the much more trodden path of I'm going to mobilize people against Helms. I'm going to paint him as an evil guy who doesn't care about the rest of the, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, maybe, 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 you know, they would have gotten this kind of thing done, um, but he wouldn't have made Helms an ally. Um, it wouldn't have stuck, I don't think, in the way that it ended up doing. And I'm, I'm doubtful it would have ever happened to begin with. That's one prominent example. I mean, and we have many examples at search. Um, if you have time for it, I'd love to tell you just one from our own community, because I was so, you know, our, um, our Kenya director, Judy Kamamo, you know, <laughs> she, she, reckon, she saw something going on that, that a lot of our teams see right now, which is that, again, as security forces and governments struggle to deal with violent extremism, a lot of them are taking approaches because they don't, oftentimes don't know any better and they retreat to what they know when, when they don't have particularly creative ideas on how to tackle these issues. And, and the policies that they implement, oftentimes the medicine's worse than the, or the cure is worse than the disease, as they put it, right? The medicine's worse than the disease. So, so this was happening in Kenya where Al-Shabaab was, you know, coming in and at the, the uh, a violent extremist group was uh -huh. using the shores to infiltrate and then to escape. Um, and um, the government trying to tackle this issue uh, finally got so frustrated, they just banned night fishing. They banned fishing at night. Well, that's a 
pretty fundamental part of the economy on the coast of Lamu and uh, you know up and down that coast. And so it was having a devastating effect on the economy. And frankly, it was it was yielding to uh, a real a recruitment <laughs> of, of Kenyan youth to Al Shabaab. So Judy started facilitating these conversations between Kenyan youth, the fishermen, and the security agencies that eventually led them to sitting on the same, rather than, you know, the metaphor of sitting across from each other, seeing each other as the problem, sitting on the same side of the table facing the shared problem. Um, and they ended up coming up with some very creative and specific things like uh, electronic IDs that could be scanned for fishermen, that you would get registered as a fisherman. And, 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 and they reopened night fishing. Um, this was just two years ago. Uh, and revive basically the economy of an entire region. Mm. Um, and we see this kind of thing again and again and again, um, you know, where, where you know, when you, the relations aren't there between communities and government or, you know, national, people in charge of national security don't have a lot of experience or creativity and they retreat to what they know um, when they're dealing with, you know, instability that they don't know how to handle, you know. Um, so this is the first real big thing that I'm seeing in the nonprofit sector generally, not just in peace building. It is a over-reliance on an adversarial approach to drive change mm. that I think too often yields pyrrhic temporary victories, bad relations, you know, and, and pull and over time more and more uh, polarization. And the last thing I would say about it is I think there's something incredibly powerful about a collaborative approach that really aligns your means and your ends. I think it's very hard to, to create a just and collaborative society through uh, adversarial uh, means. Um, and so I think there's also at a principle level, even not, even beyond the sort of tactical and practical level, um, I think collaborative approaches are something we're, we feel quite strongly about it at Search. I love those stories. And um, of course, I think of Nelson Mandela who famously did not see, who saw his enemies as he had to see them not as enemies to move things forward. It also goes back to what you're talking about earlier about your culture and values. If this is what you're trying to do in the world, you have to bring it home to how people work with each other in the organization, right? Yeah. And yeah. that's... And it's interesting know. that you mentioned Mandela. We gave uh, Archbishop Tutu a Common Ground Award many years ago, and in his speech, he said, you need to see your enemy, you need to see your adversaries uh, uh, as friends waiting to be made. That's the way he put it. That's perfect. That gave um, me goosebumps, yeah. And I think that it's interesting too, when you take people, you know, oftentimes this sort of, do I choose an adversarial approach or collaborative approach? People break this down in a real false dichotomy between, you know, justice on one side and peace on the other, that there's something somehow more principled about being adversarial you know, um, and, and weaker about being collaborative. And I think that's absolutely wrong. And when you look at people like Mandela or Martin Luther King or Gandhi, or, you know, you see people who both the justice advocates and the peace you know, advocates embrace them as, as heroic figures and models to be emulated. So we know even through those examples that actually there is nothing contradictory here or um, um, it, it, it's challenging, um, but, but you can, you, you can sort of take those approaches. And, and there's a metaphor, you know, there's a martial art in, the, you know, it searches founding, we used to talk about this a lot. And I'm sorry to talk about it more these days because I think in the current adversarial politics, people get it. The martial art of Aikido, mm. you know, if anyone's ever watched an Aikido master, you know, you, want, you can go to YouTube and watch any Aikido match, right? You see Aikido master. Uh, you'll never see an Aikido master strike anyone, right? They never strike back. And the whole, the whole idea of Aikido is to get both yourself and your attacker to a safe place to get both yourself and your attacker to a safe place right so you see aikido masters where people are kicking and swinging at them and tech, you know and they are deflecting the strikes by just five degrees or you know flipping their adversary but making sure they land you know um and essentially essentially exhausting their attackers and and i think that frankly i think the I think the common ground approach, the collaborative approach is sort of the Aikido approach to social change. It's neither retreating and being weak, but nor is it, um, you know, responding in kind with force or an adversarial approach. It's, it's actually, it's going in a completely different direction that's really powerful. And I love the both getting both the attacker and self to a safe place. It's no one, yeah. no, not one is above the other. We're both, this is the goal, we're both, going to be safe and i think you have to be careful and i you know 
I would never tell somebody who's on the receiving end, you know, um, of power dynamics, you know, I would never lecture them on how they should, you know, how they should respond to mm -hmm. falsely imprisoned or tortured or persecuted. I, that, I don't want to be misunderstood here. This is about uh, what approach do we each take uh, and who are the uh, people and what is the kind of, of social change that we each want to support. And so at search, um, uh, without in any way denigrating people who feel the need to take other approaches, we are 100% committed to the collaborative common ground approach. Um, I think what we do feel very strongly about, and what I feel personally very strongly about, the, the notion that that approach is somehow weaker, less principled, uh, or frankly even less effective than an adversarial approach, I think is exactly wrong. Um, and, I, and, I think, and I think increasingly as the world gets more interconnected and these problems become, you know, we're more interdependent whether we like it or not, I think the more and more the truth of that is going to bear out for people. And I'm watching the time. And the one other thing that you wanted to, we wanted to cover was um, before we say goodbye to you, was how we misunderstand what peace building organizations are. Yeah. Yes. Well, yeah. I mean, what I've found with peace building that's very hard right now. And I think a lot of my peers, um, both who are working for dedicated peace building organizations like Search, um, or who are just out there doing really good work as community peace builders. Like this, mm -hmm. you know, um, this is not a bureaucrat bureaucratized field, nor should it be. I think what I find is is um, that uh, people don't think of peace building as a field, right? Um, or to the extent they think of it, uh, they have they tend to have very outdated and pejorative notions that peace building is about holding hands and singing songs. It's sort of nice when you can afford it, but it's not relevant in the real world. And, um, and, and that is such a mischaracterization of how much the practice of peace building and citizen led peace building has evolved over the last 40 years. Um, the reason that we have community leaders, religious leaders, CEOs of major multinational corporations, national security advisors of mass major countries, seeking partnership with us, supporting the work that we're doing, asking for help, is, is not because we're just about holding hands and singing songs. That you do some of that in peace building, of course, in the right context, but, um, but it's, 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 uh, it's, I think, a, a much better uh, developed um, uh, approach to driving social change and to solving shared problems, which more and more um, leaders today at all different levels of society are realizing that they need um, um, and, and they're looking for, for better ways. So, um, you know, quickly, I could tell you there, there are basically three, um, the three elements of our approach that we would like to see mainstreamed much more, um, um, even within the peace building field, let alone beyond. Uh, the first is, I think our analytical perspective has a lot to do, you know, uh, with things. And, and we take a we make a conscious choice to look for signs of hope and to invest mm. in them. Um, some people call this an asset-based approach. Uh, there's a whole field called appreciative inquiry, which if your viewers haven't uh, looked into it, I encourage people to just look up what appreciative inquiry says. It's a very well-researched field, but essentially appreciative inquiry says that the worst way to change behavior is to punish bad behavior. The best way to change behavior is to identify, celebrate, incentivize every step, even the most incremental step towards the desired behavior. And so the way this plays out in peace building is I think there's still, a, there's oftentimes an over-reliance on a fragility-based approach or, you know, conflict assessment where you, you look, it's almost like being a trauma surgeon doing triage. You look, what are the worst problems and let's try to tackle the worst problems. The problem with that approach is if you go into a place like Syria or Yemen or frankly Chicago, you go anywhere and you wanting to deal with police community relations or tensions and you take that problem-focused approach, it tends to be a recipe for cynicism and hopelessness. Because even when you come across signs of hope, you tend to dismiss them. Oh, she's wonderful, but she's one woman in a patriarchal society. What difference can she make? Or that police captain is trying to get discipline over his, you know, his cadets and his police officers, but he's one police captain in a really corrupt, out of control police force. What difference can he make? So the, we, we've found is when you take a, an appreciative inquiry approach or a hope-based approach to, to all, when, when that's the perspective you take in, you ask a different set of questions. If it's an ethnic divide, you ask, uh, is there anybody across this divide who you trust? 
Mm. If it's a corrupt government, is there one minister who's trying to serve the population? If it's an out of control military or police force, is there a captain, a colonel? Is there a beat cop? Is there, is there anybody who's, who's and what you find is 100% of the time, 100% of the time, even in the most seemingly hopeless situations, you get lots of answers. And when the same names come up again and again from that kind of an approach, those are the people in the institutions that we gravitate towards that we try to work with. The second step that we'd like to see a lot more of is, is really support for local peace building. Mm. All of our teams, both our staff and the constellation of partners that we work with, I would call them transformative teams. A transformative team is local. It represents the dividing lines that they seek to bridge. You know, if you're going to go into even, let's say, let's take the Chicago example again. If you want to work on youth police relations, it might help a lot if you had some retired police officers, former gang members and other people on your team or among your partners or determining, you know, how to strategize. So, so that's the second part of our, you know, you start with a place of hope and then you build and support a network of, of local partners, uh, local, local peace builders. Uh, and the third element is, is that all of the cooperation that those local teams are really trying to drive across dividing lines uh, is not intended just to resolve a specific dispute or solve a specific problem, but to really drive a systemic change in how mm. communities deal with difference. And, and what we found is that tends to come in one of three forms. You either catalyze a shift in institutional behavior, like a, the police adopt a community policing approach or you know whatever it might be, or you're able to affect a shift in social norms how a critical mass of the population deals with these differences, or you can give rise to local markets that provide, that fund and pay for an ongoing local, locally led peace building intervention. Any one of those three forms of change, the, the thing that's common about them is if you achieve that level of change, it no longer has any reliance whatsoever on external support. Uh, it will sustain and grow, uh, you know, on its own. And so those are the three elements uh, of peace building approaches that we don't think are really well understood uh, and are not universally practiced. Um, um, starting from a place of hope, um, you know, identifying and supporting uh, local peace builders that represent the dividing lines um, um, uh, and, and working with them to drive really systemic change, uh, not just resolve specific disputes. Very beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing with us. And I'm watching the time and I know um, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I so appreciate this. It's been a great conversation. Mm -hmm.